And I think that one thing that really stuck with me was, or that really influenced me was seeing all the women here talking about all the things that they've done, the organizations they work with, the leadership positions that you guys are involved in, um, your education background or, or everything. It has been so inspiring just like hearing all of these women talk about their experiences and how they've gotten to the positions that you all are in has been so inspiring for me. So I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. It's very empowering to see women take their position um, in positions of leadership, advocacy. And I'm so amazed by these wonderful women that come here despite them having jobs, despite them having families that, you know, they've, and I come here and I'm so inspired by the dedication and just how driven everybody here is and I just want to like really thank everybody. In order for us to be here today, it took a first person to open the door. And this is the mission that we have here today, to leave the center with the mission of being a first in our community, to break those barriers and once we get there, to pull everybody else up with us. Remember always to give back and encourage those who come after us. Once we've cracked open the door or pushed it open, our job is to keep it open or remove the door so that, so that it stays open. Welcome everyone, I'm Audrey Peck, pronouns she, her, hers, and a fellow Commonwealth Seminar alumna and moderator for tonight's panel on Kicking in the Door. Celebrating more than 1,000 women strong who have graduated from the seminar program, that's amazing. And in just a few moments, we'll be hearing from three of these remarkable women leaders in public service. Uh, but first, just a few announcements. Uh, of course, it's a historic day. Michelle Wu has been officially sworn in as our mayor of Boston, the first woman and person of color elected as mayor of our beloved city in its 391 year history. <laughs> So if you're able to catch the live stream of today's ceremony, go ahead and drop one word. Even if you couldn't um, tune in, feel free to drop one word in the chat box. Let me describe what this moment means to you. And while you're doing that, let's also give a shout out to Charlotte Golar Ritchie, one of our founding advisory board members of the Commonwealth Seminar, who has been appointed as co-chair of Mayor Wu's transition team. We're really looking forward to great things ahead. So as you know, uh, Commonwealth Seminar's Executive Director, Leverett Wing, I informally call him Lev, <laughs> and his team have worked tirelessly to plan an incredible week, a week of homecoming celebrations for 
so, uh, Commonwealth Seminar. So we hope you'll join in um, on our in-person and virtual reunion events tomorrow night. And be sure not to miss Thursday's virtual event at noon of In the Room and at the Table when we celebrate this semester's seminar graduates and pay tribute to alumni honorees. So Lev, I don't know if I can quickly drop the links in the chat box for upcoming events, but I'll do that. <laughs> All right. So it's now my privilege to turn to our panel of dynamic women leaders in public service who have been making some history of their own while forging a path for this next generation of leaders in um, a growing, a diverse, multicultural, intersectional world. So I'll kick off our conversation with a few questions. If you have a question you'd like to submit to our panel, um, Leverett will keep an eye on the chat box and let us know and we'll try and get to them. So please welcome our panelists in no particular order. Let's go alpha. <laughs> Rodlene Lujan from the neighborhoods of Hyde Park and Mattapan. She works as assistant district attorney in the Suffolk DA's office with Rachel Rollins. And Stephanie Martins, city councilor of Everett. She's the first Latinx ever elected to Everett's city council. And Samantha Perlman, city councilor of Marlboro the youngest to be elected on Marlboro City Council. Let's welcome them. We're in good company today. So I've always, and this is, you know, intended to be a conversation. I hope that you can all mute, unmute yourselves, panelists, because you can jump in as needed. But I've always been a firm believer that together, um, women can transform the world. And each of you are change makers in your communities and beyond. Um, bringing forward your authentic voices, which are so needed. So I'd like to ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves uh, in your own voices, of course, by sharing with us what inspired you to enter public service and, and tell us how that connects to your work today. Let's start with Rodney. And Hi, Audrey. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. My name is Rodeline. I am an assistant district attorney in the Suffolk County DA's office, as um, Audrey already stated. Um, and I I'm an attorney. And my position or, or my journey to this position was very non-traditional. I had um, graduated from law school um, and shortly thereafter, uh, DA Rollins announced that she was running for, or Rachel at the time, announced she was running for DA. Um, and so I asked to join her team and um, she was saying all of the right things, really thinking about a transformational change of the criminal justice system. And so I had known her through um, this program called the Rappaport, um, uh, Rappaport uh, found it through the Rappaport Foundation. And so when I asked to join her team, she was like, of course, um, let's go. And so I've been on her team since then and I haven't looked back a day since. And so um, I, in terms of my background doing this work and what inspired me to do this work, I come from a family of public servants, um, whether, uh, you know, um, and I'm also the youngest sister of um, one of uh, the newly elected um, to the Boston City Councilor, um, Rootsy Lujan. Um, and so I'm really excited about that as well. But one of the things my sister says is that our, our father is a really great example of what it means to be um, a, a, a great community member. Really thinking about how you can, you know, help your community um, and, and really thinking about how, um, one person can be all of the difference as we saw uh, earlier today. Um, and so uh, thinking about borderless communities and, and really building that up. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, the legacy I come from and that's what inspired me. Thank you. What a fantastic legacy that is of change makers. <laughs> um, Brava. And um, let's move to Councillor Stephanie Martins. Sure, good evening, and I'm so excited to be here with all these amazing women, and I want to apologize in advance for my dog being a little <laughs> distracted, but he's um, vandalizing the world around me as I speak, but anyway, so I'm a city council in the city of Everett, I was the first Latina elected. 
elected. I just recently got reelected, which is really exciting. And I also kind of had a non-traditional journey to where I am now. I was involved in different Know Your Rights campaigns. I worked um, educating the Latino community and connecting them in terms of um, political education and other campaigns at the state level, just making sure people understood where to vote, how to vote, who they were voting for, and what the positions were. And then I looked around my own community and I realized that we had such a diverse city with no representation at the table. So at the time we only had one woman and all men and everybody was white in our city council. So it was important to bring a different perspective and to uh, really bring that new voice and vision and to bring the city, make the city welcome everybody else. So we're one Everett. So that was my, my journey here. Wonderful. You know, we love unconventional paths, don't we? Because women, we're, we're so creative in navigating our way through awesome. uncharted waters. So thank you so much. Counselor Samantha Perlman. Sure. And I just want to echo everyone else's sentiments. Like what a incredible group of people, um, both watching this um, and on the panel. It's an honor to be here with you all. And uh, nice to see you all, Samantha Perlman. I'm a city counselor uh, in Marlboro, which is probably the most west of, of the group here. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I also got elected when Stephanie did in 2019 and just got reelected, I guess, two weeks ago now, right, Stephanie? So it feels yeah. like feels like it was just yesterday, but also like three years ago. So it, you know, um, it comes and it goes. And similarly, I feel like my path to public service was really a combination of a lot of people um, and a lot of work in the nonprofit sector. So uh, my professional background has been working in civic education and youth voting work, particularly. Uh, and I worked at one particular nonprofit um, called Generation Citizen with the impetus of how to get young people engaged in their own communities uh, through project-based civics. Uh, and that was one of the first times I always thought, and this I think I was working there when I had just graduated college, I felt like, oh, you know, once you graduate college, you're, you know, no one cares about your professional development anymore, right? You're no longer like a young person. Um, and it was completely the opposite. Here we were helping students really take agency in their own communities and identify an issue and enact policy change, right? And no one was telling them that they couldn't do it because of their age. And I was, you know, living in Marlboro where I grew up commuting into Boston and was like, what am I doing to give back to my community? And um, started to get locally involved, really saw a lack of women and young people in all of those spaces. Similarly to uh, what Stephanie was mentioning about a very homogenous council, there was only one woman at the time. Most people were retired and just I didn't see someone like myself or other people that I grew up with represented and really wanted to make a difference and help the community. And I saw a lot of changes happening and thought, you know, if I want to see more young women in office then I need to be vulnerable enough to do it myself as well. So uh, that's something I know later on we might get to a question of advice, but definitely, you know, if, if you believe it, there's no reason why you can't be one of the people, you know, to start that, that path um, and help others follow. Absolutely. So inspiring and, you know, your initiatives, all of you, Amazing, leading by example, and hope others will do the same. So we all know that women make up of over half of the workforce, yet only around 20%, I believe, are in leadership positions across all sectors. Um, and while progress is being made, um, present company included, one election, one appointment at a time, there's still so many doors that we need opened. So reflecting on your own experiences and perhaps even taking into account your own leadership styles, what do you see as the most significant barrier to women stepping into public service or leadership roles? Who wants to take a stab at it? I'll, go, I'll get us started because there's so many things and we women, we do so much. So we're responsible for so many things. We have so many roles. And sometimes it starts with our own lives. Like if I do this, who's gonna take care of my children? Who's gonna do this? Who's gonna do that? So it's a, it's a matter of first organizing your own time because we're responsible for so many things. And I would also say that we um, question ourselves too much and we need to stop that and just take the step and just do it. But I see a lot of us just you know, creating obstacles for ourselves as well. But I definitely start with the structural obstacles in our roles as women, where it's much easier for a dad to just go and show up at an event versus a mom who's gonna take care of my children. 
and uh, everything else. <laughs> so I'll mm -hmm. start with that, but I'm sure there are more things that uh, the other councils can add. Yes, absolutely. Multitasking, structural obstacles, expectations, our own, but you, you actually, um, you know, thank you for your honesty. I mean, in, in terms of our own sense of um, seeing ourselves as leaders too. You know, I don't know about you. I can speak for myself. Sometimes it's the whole imposter syndrome thing. So, you know, those are things that we have to overcome at the same time that we're trying to um, make a change. Others, uh, Rodney? I'm going to, yeah, no, no. I will, um, kudos to what you said, Stephanie. Definitely agree with everything. I'm going to pack. Uh, piggyback on two specific ideas. One is, as Audrey mentioned, the idea of imposter syndrome, right? There are um, a lot of people who have gotten to their positions to today, not because of their capabilities at the time they applied or they went for that position, but because they believed in their own potential. And I think women, you know, we kind of second guess ourselves a lot. Um, and we're taught to really think, you know, think things through and think the negatives, and maybe focus a little bit too much on the negatives rather than say, you know, um, I'll learn as I go. Um, or I, 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 I read somewhere, somebody said, we're not given the opportunity to fail up and we don't get the opportunity to fail up. Whereas other, um, uh, I wouldn't say constituencies, but other demographics do get to do that. Um, and so that's one thing. And another thing that's really specific to like leadership positions, but elected leadership positions is getting to pay for childcare with your campaign funds, right? Um, we now have a woman mayor in Boston, two young kids, I'm not sure how she did it on the campaign trail, but you know, that is one major barrier for a lot of women because they have to think about who can I leave my child with? Do I have a mother? Do I have a, a sibling? Do I have a, a, an, an affordable nanny that I can leave my children with when I do have to go to all these events? And so that is one very specific example of a larger issue where women um, as um, counselor, I can't see your last name, but I'll say Counselor Stephanie um, said before, um, um, women take on so many roles and, and really balance, doing that balancing act between children and um, parents and or aging parents and other responsibilities. It is really a, a struggle that uh, sometimes they have to pay out of pocket for and that really puts a strain. So, yeah. Yes, thank you for those important points. Councillor Perlman, would you like to add? Yeah, I can jump on this. Uh, and I, I really appreciate what was already said. And the way I sort of think of it is sort of is like the internal barriers and there's the external barriers, right? So I know we talked a lot about the imposter syndrome. I also feel like we all as women are socialized to think that we can achieve certain things. Um, you know, we've only seen particularly white male role models in these positions and haven't, you know, seen that barrier being breaking, uh, broken. And I really love the like kick in the door uh, mentality because it really is just like, go for it, right? A lot of times, like, you know, and obviously I'm, I'm coming at it from, you know, the idea of running for office and the barriers there, but the biggest issue, right, is recruitment to get women to run. When they run, they win at the same rates as men. It's about this step to say, I'm going to step into my power and into my leadership and for me, I just think it's sort of like, you just can't overthink it, right? Sometimes there's a million reasons why not to do something, right? And you just keep telling yourself that, but the really, you just say like, why wouldn't I do it? Not like, why should I? But like, why not? I think there's never a good time to do these things. I think we're always waiting for a window. It doesn't exist, right? That's just how we procrastinate. I would say go for it. And, you know, particularly in terms of just women more generally, right? It's just like changing the narrative. And sometimes you need to be that person who's up in the front. Um, and what's something that really warms my heart in my community is, you know, obviously there's not a lot of women or young people in elected office and um, a friend of mine who has like young boys, um, one time they were saying, oh, did you see this other elected official in the community who is a male? And they, when they were describing it, they kept using female pronouns like, oh, what does she look like? I don't know what she looks like. And that's because they've only interacted with me as an elected official, right? And that reshaped their perception of who is in leadership. And so I think oftentimes those role models are so key. 
Um, and I know for myself, I try to be, you know, the elected official I wish I had seen on my council growing up, right? Someone that I would look up to. I worked with a lot of young people on my campaign and high school students and really try to just open up the process. And I think a lot of it is supporting one another, right? Um, and making sure that we all are, you know, achieving our goals, whether that's elected office or leadership in your profession. Like sometimes it's scary to be the first or the second or the third, but every time there's more people who step up to the plate, right? You're widening the circle and allowing more people that opportunity um, and that mentorship that is so key. Thank you so much. Yes, and here's a community. You can all connect as well in your respective roles. Um, I think there was a comment in the chat about Michelle being fortunate enough to have some family support, of course. I mean, everyone has their support system, but uh, you know, many times I've seen Michelle, you know, with the kid, even today, the kids on the hip. Um, and it's interesting because our lived experiences, and this is why representation and voices around the table are so critical, because it really, you know, um, given her own lived experiences, she could have compassion for other young mothers and people juggling children and work. Um, and it helped ultimately shape her to push fa uh, paid family leave. Um, and, and I think for the public officials, um, and uh, in the room, <laughs> you know, certainly that's something that uh, you can use your experiences to shape policy um, going forward, of course, as well. But, um, and yes. that wasn't to discount her two younger sisters. I am sure that they are wonderful babysitters, but also as she did on the city council, putting that structure there um, to support young mothers and also young fathers. Um, Absolutely. And, and and figure out next steps and really give them that additional cushion so that they don't have to have these concerns. They don't have to, especially when you're running for office, you don't have a job, you can't work, right? So, or usually. Um, so having that extra cushion is, that that was the very specific point I was making, so. Yes, thank you, important point. And uh, yeah, it takes a village to raise a, raise a child and more than one child. And sometimes it takes a community to support families. So, Add. Sorry, yes. if I could just one thing I would just say um, to wrap up this subject is just don't be afraid to take up space because I see the guys don't have a problem with that. They will talk over, they will get their point across, they will show up, they will run for things. So why hold back as women? We're so qualified, we're so ready, we have so much to offer. And one thing that I heard once that shocked me at a colleague's event who was a male colleague was that he gave his speech saying I am proud of myself because I am proud of this I'm proud of that when would you ever see a woman ever daring to even take credit for the things that she has done so it's time for us to take that step and not be afraid to take up space yes a very very critical reminder for all of us so I would say that, you know, the struggle um, to achieve equal representation, right, is not limited, though, to women alone. And so since equity of access to local government is at the core of Commonwealth Seminar's mission, um, let's, uh, we, we have touched upon this a little bit, but I'd like to hear what steps each of you are taking to ensure that more diverse voices are in the room and maybe around the table, not so much at the table as if it, you know, that's not enough, right? The, the, more, the more people, diverse voices around the table, uh, we can move the needle forward even faster. So we have a more reflective government um, and one that can work for all of us. So um, if, uh, Councilor Perlin, let's start with you. With regard to what steps do you take to help ensure that diverse voices are around the table. Oh, sorry, sorry. That I thought I was unmuted, but Zoom technology has done it again. So my apologies, but I was going to say, you know, the Commonwealth Seminar, first of all, I just really want to give a shout out because uh, what an incredible program, you know, so honored to be an alum with all of you. I mean, I just have felt so welcomed and what a great opportunity to like raise the bar about what you know about 
government and policy and building a network and getting involved and just being present, right? There's a way where it really is, you know, um, participation is probably the most important thing you can do, right? Is showing up and, and being active and having your voice heard. And I think the Commonwealth Summit does a great job of empowering people to do that on whatever their topic of interest is. So I did want to start there because, um, you know, we're all fortunate to be graduates. And uh, in terms of kind of building that pipeline um, and the around the table mentality, you know, for me, I've done a lot of work on uh, whether it's kind of translating things um, in our community so that we have access um, as we have a lot of um, learners from all different languages and having access, particularly in Portuguese and Spanish for a lot of our city documents. Um, I do a lot of work with youth on making sure that they understand local government, uh, making sure that you know, they have the opportunity to participate in city council meetings if they want to be able to submit any sort of comments. Um, I do a lot of breakdowns actually about the city council meetings on social media to kind of recap. And, you know, I think there's a lot of bureaucracy in government and just trying to streamline it to what is the most important information that people need to know is really important. Um, and also, you know, encouraging people, I never turn down an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, even if I've never met them, they're across the country to kind of share a little bit about my story, talk about what it was like, particularly in running for office. I do a lot of work on that because I want more young women to be running um, and showing that like, you know, I didn't have everything figured out and there's so many programs to tap into for support for a lot of these efforts. And so I think for anyone who's maybe like on the fence about how to get involved, just know that, you know, every single view that you have and skill set and contribution is valid in whatever opportunity that you want to pursue. Um, and don't, right, what's the thing? It's like, don't let somebody else say no, right? Be the one like that just does it, right? Don't say no to yourself. Make sure that you're putting yourself out there. And, you know, the worst something happens is that you go for an opportunity that doesn't work out, then you go for another one and you keep trying. So I think a lot of the benefit of, you know, government is really when everyone is being represented. So um, especially now with the pandemic, when things have been online and in some ways more accessible in some ways less accessible, you know, if people don't have broadband, there's a lot of issues to be addressed to make government what it is, but the only way it can improve is with your input. Um, and so I really think opening up government, um, which is literally what, as I'm looking at the Commonwealth Seminar slogan right now, right? Making sure that it is something where it's like horizontally led, people have the opportunity to have their voices heard and, um, just excited that you know this work is continuing and excited to hear what my colleagues here say. Thank you so much, Councillor Perlman. And um, I'm just going to ask if people online who have questions for our panel, uh, please feel free to drop your question in the chat box. But um, Rodlene or Councillor Martins, would you like to take a stab on how to get more people around the table? Sure. So um, just like uh, Samantha man mentioned, I also want to thank the, the seminar. The seminar brought me to the State House for the first time, and it's a public building and how many people actually go there. So that's something that I've also been, been doing here, which is preaching that City Hall, it's a public building. And I've been trying to create opportunities for more people to come and more people to see our meetings, for more kids to get paid internships. But also, um, I think just our existence already brings new voices to the table. Like uh, just me being on the council was the first time that we talked about period poverty, first time that we talked about what happens post postpartum when we had the paid family medical leave discussion. Um, it was the first time that we've had many different conversations and just bringing a lens to of how our diverse communities process things. So we, when we were working on the around the vaccine, how do we respond to things? How, uh, what are the concerns of these communities? How do we actually reach out to them? And even COVID, when we had free resources available from the city, but how are people communicating? How are we getting to people so they actually know what we offer? And we have 60,000 people in the city and only about the same few thousand people participating and, and benefiting from certain benefits. So it's been really been it's been a mission of how to actually get to people and bring those voices and understand those thoughts and show the city how to respond to everybody. So I've been going to people's doors, uh, visiting businesses, having different conversations, learning where people congregate, how people function, translating. So it's a, it's an ongoing work and all, always um, 
I, I'm really proud to be able to also use my position to create a platform and step back and have people take ownership of whatever we're working on where they can shine, they can get the experience and I'm just a channel for them to get there. So I created our first youth council and I'm so, but there's so many different things and the work never ends. <laughs> Yeah, you, uh, counselors Perlman and Martins, you guys um, gave some really great um, suggestions and ditto to everything that you said, whether it's increasing language access. And we are in the greater Boston area where there's a diversity of uh, people, cultures, and languages, and just making sure that people are able to uh, communicate um, or get communications in their language is, is a big deal. I think, you know, while I, I, I know that I'm pretty much zoomed out for, for a lot of after a year and a half of this pandemic, but it has done incredible things like um, this type of um, gathering, right? Where I probably would not have been able to make a physical gathering because I would be working still, um, but I'm able to, you know, come on electronically and reach out and connect with people from at least four different communities here um, as panelists. And so really thinking about how we can use this new virtual technology that people are a little bit more, you know, familiar with to connect people from different communities, um, which doesn't happen a lot in the greater Boston area, which is a shame, but hopefully um, Zoom is one way that it can change. And um, bringing this kind of back to, you know, the political right now, as we just finished a uh, political um, season, I think it's also really great that we had uh, women, people of color hiring other women and people of color. Um, and that is just a, a way of building a, a pipeline, right? Building a pathway um, in a, profession uh, or campaign professions that are predominantly um, filled by white males. Um, so I think that is one way to, you know, really look not at the people's resumes, but look at their talents and, and their potential. And that is, at least for me, what I saw happening a lot across um, the spectrum in terms of um, uh, campaigns, beliefs, or camp, uh, sorry, elected officials' beliefs or campaigners' beliefs, they hired people not just for their resume, but also for their potential. And, and that was an incredible thing to see because now these are people who can staff other campaigns. They have that on their resume and that is how you build a bench, right? Um, and a bench that reflects the diversity of the region in which we live. And so I think that's, those are some really great things to do. Thank you all, really invaluable. Um, in terms of the, you know, the technology, absolutely. It, it uh, brings us together. Normally it would be challenging to do so even from um, in, an access point of transportation, right? Um, but also, you know, the pandemic, let's talk about the pandemic a little bit. And we're almost out, there's light on the horizon, but um, it clearly has exposed uh, disparities of all kinds, uh, including the disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, but also gender inequality. Because as we were discussing earlier, you know, um, women, um, they have rised up to the challenge of what's required of them at home and at work, but they've also been leaving the traditional workplace um, in droves. So uh, the pandemic has sort of put the spotlight on the needs of caregivers um, and most often than not, not to exclude anyone else who's a caregiver, but it does fall on the shoulders of women. So um, can we take a moment to discuss how you're addressing the challenges um, of a, a changing work environment in the context of women leaving the workplace, as well as balancing the needs around caregiving. Who's 
Stephanie Martin, Council Martin. Oh no, it looks like Rodney. I mean, I, I can't really speak to it because I'm just a lowly ADA, but I know that in um, our court, our supervisor has a child and you know, that means stepping in when she can't come into work, right? Or giving her the flexibility of, not really giving her the flexibility, but like, you know, this is one community, right? And so she should be able to care for her child and us really handle the court that matters. And I think, you know, if you take that and you apply it into a greater context of really thinking about how we give people flexibility now that we do have Zoom, right? Or we have smartphones where I can take a picture of something and suit her text if I need her, right? But really thinking about how we can integrate all of this um, and, and make it a, just a little bit easier for parents, whether women or, or men, usually women, but like really thinking about how to use this uh, the, this electronic space or um, technological space um, to give people literal space, you know, um, to, to, to be not just workers, but also humans, mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons. And so, yeah. Great. Thank you. People are praising your points, Ronnie. <laughs> on the chat room. I'm just taking a moment to look at the chat. Um, yes, Melissa said earlier that more virtual programming also makes it easier for giving access to people with disabilities. And unbeknownst to me, a seminar has launched Seminar Beyond English initiative to bring the program in different languages. That's really awesome. Okay, so if there are additional questions for the panelists, please drop them in the chat box. Um, Councilor Martin? Little, Councilor oh. Martin, I think, was going to add a little on the last question. Yes. I was just going to say, um, so from our perspective in Everett, where we're a gateway city, lower income, a lot of the parents just couldn't stop working. And unfortunately, with COVID, we, we had a lot of children at home by themselves. A lot of children struggling to participate in class because they didn't have an adult su supervising them. We had kids babysitting younger siblings. So it was very challenging and traumatic. And it has also been traumatic for the parents that were able to step away from work, but it, most of the child, you know, the child caring role it falls on the women and they have had to step away from being a great addition at the workplace to, being at home and, um, and parents faced a lot of challenges that we weren't really aware of before until we, uh, we had COVID. So I, I agree with the, the point that hopefully we can continue to be more flexible and use these online spaces to allow people the flexibility or even like bringing children to work. I see people bringing dogs to work. What can we do for children? Can we add daycare spaces at work? You know, what can we do so we continue to, we can continue to create a space to have those valuable voices at work? And then can we make, you know, childcare universal free, you know? So what can we do to really enable these valuable members of society to continue to be a part of society? Yeah, and I would, I would also add too, right, with all of the horrible things this pandemic has, you know, sort of amplified really every single issue that is across every different area. They're also right with great challenge comes this opportunity for change. And I think what's been incredibly inspiring is seeing people take this agency to say, you know, business as usual was not working. Why would we ever go back to it? Right. And so reestablishing what those norms are, the dynamics that we should have, whether it's, you know, women in the workforce, what does it look like to commute? What does transportation mean? What does it mean, you know, to have a family? What, you know, responsibilities do we expect our government to have? What do we expect from one another, our healthcare system? Like all of these questions really should be up for discussion because that's how real change happens, right? There's something that just shifts everyone's day to day, right? And where's the motivation for change if there isn't this kind of pausing moment? And, you know, we just assumed that it had to be that way and it doesn't. And so I think that what's the most profound thing as we think about, you know, these changing circumstances is our role in helping change this. So it not only impacts our lives, but the lives of, you know, the people who come after us. And so, you know, if there's something that people are thinking about that they want to work on, they should totally go for it and, you know, use the Commonwealth Seminar Network to, to get it moving. And 
I even think of, I was working, you know, from home remotely for a while and, and now I'm back in school, but working remotely, I was like, wow, I commuted three hours a day. Like, what could I have done with that time, right? And what does that add up? Years of my life, years of everyone's lives, people who have to, you know, because you can't afford to work where or live where you work and that like it costs so much and public transportation and driving and all of these things and um you know what does it mean to have recreational time and space and mental health right being so pivotal and important that we were forced to push aside but is so central to our well-being and if there's anything i've seen that workplaces have had to confront is that they need to address the whole person right and you're not your output right you're just as much important about your morale and your um you know dedication to the work and your passion and commitment and so i think all of us should be questioning the way things have been and what possibilities are still on the horizon beautifully stated all of you and um yeah absolutely I, there are benefits you know to zooming <laughs> as much as it's it's draining on our eyes and and time but it is um interestingly enough whether a dog interrupts your zoom call or a child like we are seeing each other in different spaces so it invites us to look at people um as whole human beings you know with lives outside of work right so we have all uh, a lot to gain from flexible work arrangements and recognizing people's um, priorities and juggling, you know, all aspects of life uh, so that we can uh, provide input and perhaps advocate change for more inclusive um, work models. So um, let me see, do we have questions? Oh, someone said that there are all, it's a lot of challenge for parents with special children, of course it is as well. So we, um, we do have a lot of work to do to make it happen and, and be as inclusive as possible. And sorry, I was just gonna add on, um, counselors Martin and Perlman touched on this, but like what are we, and I kind of said this, but not in such beautiful language, but what do we owe to each other as people, right? And that's really something that's important um, and that we've kind of like explored a little bit in this pandemic, um, at least in the workspace and outside. And, but like really thinking about um, as um, members of one community, right? Um, what is it that we can do to help others, even if it's not necessarily in our best interest, right? Like thinking about the give and take of society and community and living in community with people. Yes, thank you. So um, let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, I would like to ask the panelists um, about their view on media, mainstream or social media, um, because, you know, your view on coverage of women in public service, I'm curious about that, as, whether, as to whether media has mostly helped or has it hindered the real work that's going on the ground that all of you have a part in. Shall we start with Councillor Perlman? Yes, so I'm always very cognizant of how the media characterizes women. And so just, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but I always feel, and you know, here I am at the local level, so I'm getting like the lowest brunt of it, but right, the higher up that people are, the more known they are, the more scrutiny they receive. And so, you know, and there's some really great work that the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, um, um, the Barley Foundation has been doing about the way uh, women are covered in the media, but a lot of it is around, right, like women are judged by what they're wearing and what they look like, um, you know, and that is never the case for a man. Um, I actually had a reporter write that um, when I had an interview with them that I was physically and mentally exhausted is how I looked. And I thought that was, you know, who would put that in an article, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of wording that is used. So if women, they're not seen as confident and assertive, right? They're seen as angry or arrogant, right? Or abrasive. And these negative terms are used to describe what would have been positive qualities in a man. Um, and I think the way that women have to perceive their own leadership, they're so skeptical of, you know, it's sort of, you have to be likable. You can't just be effective and you can't just be, you know, out there and active. And so I think all of us should be really mindful of what we read and what we see. And 
you know, I always try to take everything I read about, you know, the way women are being perceived with a grain of salt because it's not the full experience, you know, and it is harmful. And, you know, social media creates a whole new dynamic, right, where it's not like you'll just be getting reporting in a certain very amount of time on maybe even a daily basis, but it could be a 24-7 constant communication of people saying things. And, you know, if you ever like look at a tweet and then read when people respond to it, just some of the nasty things that are said about an individual that honestly usually have nothing to do with what the person actually wrote, but it's just a way to attack and target and troll. Um, and so I, I just really think it's important to to scrutinize that and to ask more for the way that women are perceived in the media. And especially at the federal level, I just feel like the way, um, you know, we were fortunate to have many women seeking the presidency, which was an incredible thing to have multiple women doing so. Um, and just the way that they were covered in the media, I think was, you know, harmful sometimes. And, and that's something that we all should, should not stand for. Absolutely. Um... Others on, on term, in terms of media coverage or social media. Yeah, so I fully agree. You know, of course, media coverage is important, and we appreciate you know coverage. But I've, especially now being in politics, I have started preaching to a lot of people that it's not because it's printed that it's true. Because sometimes, most of the times, people already have an angle, and they just fit your name into a narrative and it might not be the actual story it's just a story that somebody wants to tell so it's important that people get the different angles and as council perman said um there's still a lot of choice words being used for women that are not used for men and we might have the same type of reaction but it's described differently and we're still uh, sexualized in, in many ways. There's still, uh, actually recently with me, I had a situation on Veterans Day that I was telling somebody that I tried to join the Air Force when I was in high school and I couldn't do it. And the person was like, oh, you're too pretty for that. So like, when will we ever stop being a piece, you know, a piece of meat, like stop being women and just being a, prof and just be a professional doing a certain job. So we still struggle with not being able to get out of the old view for women in the media and in many different aspects um, still. So in terms of the media, I usually like to tell my own story and just send my press releases. But other than that, we always find some descriptive terms that we would, we would have liked not to have uh, read in there. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Rod Rodley? Oops, you're muted. Rodley? Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's definitely interesting. I, I've had a front row seat to see um, media coverage um, of women of color and, and kind of witness firsthand how they rely on tropes to kind of tell the story that they, they want to tell. Um, that being said, I, I also enjoyed to see, um, at least locally, um, the different takes that media are taking to cover lives of people of color and, and, and women. And I'm thinking, um, specifically of Janae Osterholt and she has a column and I'm forgetting, um, exactly what it is, but it's really revolves around people of color and thinking about, you know, um, giving voice to different perspectives, not just the perspective that the media has given traditionally to people, but filling in that voice um, and, and that space um, and kind of taking that a step further. I think, you know, social media has a lot of downs, but I think uh, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of the positives, right? That is what mobilized people across our nations to really um, organize around issues that meant a lot, whether it was um, police brutality, whether it was, um, it, I, so many different things, I'm sorry, like Black Lives Matter, whether it was, um, the pandemic itself and really thinking about what we need to do to keep our community safe. Um, social media was one tool that allowed people to, 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 to really connect and organize. Um, 
and you know beyond the pandemic when we look at stories like me too right and the me too movement social media gave people an opportunity to really cover the stories that the media wouldn't cover or talk about issues that the media was traditionally sweeping under the rug and so you know um media i there's a lot of work that needs to be done in media um it's good to see that some of the local organizations are are making some strides towards uh building a better voice like there was an article that um, the globe did uh, about michelle Wu, and she had um, both of her children with her and i just think that was such a beautiful image to see she's walking to work it was before she was running for city councilor and i think that is really beautiful to see and not an image that you see very often um so i think that is amazing but there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of social media it is like everything else in our society there are some really dark places we're thinking about this past two years year and a half and um or actually probably three because me too was 2019 right 2019 was when me too really kind of hit the ground or 2018 anyways sometime around then was when me too kind of hit the ground running and really thinking about how twitter and instagram played a role in letting women control the narratives that they wanted to give um that's pretty amazing yeah all incredible incredible points Ooh. Oh my goodness, I have a long question, um, but I do want to actually wrap up, unfortunately, because we could talk forever, um, but I wanna be respectful to everyone's time. But on the media piece, absolutely, um, you know, the power of critical thought and sharing our own stories, using our own narratives is, is important. Um, and let me see, curious for you. Oh. Curious for the panelists, can women and women of color leaders from the outside, so leaders without government nor political experience nor public, have a real shot at leading in positions? What are the opportunities for women and women of color coming from outside industries? Someone want to just reply? I mean, this isn't local, but I love the thought that Angela Merkel, um, she was a scientist. She's a trained scientist. She had no um, she was, sorry, the PM, right, for Germany for so long. Um, she came into this as that. I'm trying to think of local examples and counselors step in if you know of anybody. I know there are a lot of lawyers um, in City Hall. There are a lot of, um, uh, Anissa Sabi George, she was a teacher before. She didn't have any political experience. I don't know if counselors, you can think of any examples. Sure, I always tell people that all you need to have is a passion and it can be in any area. Maybe you're passionate about the environment. Maybe you're passionate about painting your neighborhood in, in a different color. You know, whatever your, your passion is, you just need to have this passion and share it with enough people that will vote for you. And uh, in Everett, for example, we, we have city councils that have, have barely graduated high school. So you don't need to go to, uh, to have an education in a certain area or to have been part of a certain path. You just need to have a passion in whatever area it is of life and be willing to pursue it and have other people that are passionate about the same thing to support you and hopefully get you elected. Just get involved and share with the world what is it that you're concerned about. And one really great way to kind of take that first step that I always love telling people is to join a board or commission in your community they cover such a wide variety of topics. So if you're interested in the environment, you can be on the conservation commission, or if you're interested in like zoning and the way the city is developing the planning board, right? Um, there's youth commissions or councils, there's opportunities to do work, um, you know, with the veterans or anything like that. So I really think that that's like a first way to kind of straddle what you have already been doing with particularly um, the interest in government. And our governments are stronger and better because of those varieties of background and professional experiences. So totally go for it. Um, I think everyone is kind of leading from the outside in many ways. So it's really great to have um, that presence, um, you know, and I would totally go for it. Absolutely, go for it. Thank you so much for that um, question, Louise. So in closing, I just want to leave everyone, if you will ask 
ask you to leave one piece of advice for those tuning in and who may be preparing, like Louise, to enter or lead in public service in closing. Rodley? I like to steal a, a quote that Rachel uh, made us do, or like in, always said to us on the campaign, it's make them tell you no. And that just means that even if you think you can't do it, even if you think they'll say no, sometimes people are just waiting to be asked, right? And that is like, once you put that ask out there, you'll get what you want, desire, maybe you won't, but at least you've put it out and, and, and you know, so. Councillor Martins. Sure, so I want to uh, repeat something that Council Perman said that it's also kind of my motto that I ran because I wanted to be the representative that I would like to have representing me. So if that person doesn't exist yet, be that person, open the door, set the example, inspire other people. And an advice that I actually heard at the Commonwealth seminar is no permission, no apologies. So just go for it, don't apologize. If you have something to offer, just do it, get out there. Uh, and I can jump in with something that's actually my, I guess my quote of the month, I would say it's in my head a lot is, you know, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. So if you have something you want to do, right, just go for it, right? The time is going to pass. There's never a good time to do something. Just go for it. And you don't want to ever live in regret. So I would always say to take those opportunities, create your own opportunities, um, you know, and I'm happy to, you know, connect with anyone on this call to be of help help if anyone's interested, um, whether it's running for office or just pursuing your um, particular interest area. Thank you so much. We've gone a little over, but we so appreciate all of your insights and your perspectives and sharing your personal journeys with us. Thank you all who are on this Zoom for attending and taking time out of your lives for joining us. So I'll leave a note with um, just keep lifting each other's voices. That's really what's most important. And I like uh, a one quote, um, I think it came from our speaker, first speaker of our house, of the house, Nancy Pelosi, that our diversity is our strength and our unity is our power. So thank you for attending, have a good night. And I think that one thing that really stuck with me was, or that really influenced me was seeing all the women here talking about all the things that they've done, the organizations they work with, the leadership positions that you guys are involved in, um, your education background or, or everything. It has been so inspiring. Just like hearing all of these women talk about their experiences and how they've gotten to the positions that you all are in has been so inspiring for me. So I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. It's very empowering to see women take their position um, in positions of leadership, advocacy. And I'm so amazed by these wonderful women that come here despite them having jobs, despite them having families that, you know, they've, and I come here and I'm so inspired by the dedication and just how driven everybody here is, and I just want to like really thank everybody. In order for us to be here today, it took a first person to open the door. And this is the mission that we have here today, to leave the center with the mission of being a first in our community, to break those barriers, and once we get there, to pull everybody else up with us. Remember always to give back and encourage those who come after us, once we've cracked open the door or pushed it open, our job is to keep it open or remove the door so that, so that it stays open.
beastin'. I'm on a hunt, feastin'. That's what I want, keys in. Once I get moving, can't stop what I'm doing. I go on the sound of the gun. I'm number one, I am repeating, repeating will come. Take it and run, you're leaving the crumb. Getting it done while I sing the anthem when I'm coming, I come for the top. Looking down on competition like what? I'm the legend, I'll talk about. Now hear the words coming out of my mouth. There's no point in beating around the bush. I'ma tell you bloodly what I came here for. Oh, oh, oh. I want that spot right at the top. Oh. I'm telling you something, I'm running, I'm gonna for you. I'ma leave you with nothing, I'm coming to kick in the door. Kick in the door.